Cat owners may often notice that their kitty's ears are, let's just say, dirty. Her ears got soiled with earth, states Uncle Billy casually upon inspection and continues his day. He's wrong, of course. I mean, how the hell could so much earth get into the cat's ears? This dark, ground coffee-like matter is actually inflammatory secretion resulting from ear mite infestation. Ear mites are common parasites prevalent worldwide called Otodectes cynotis in scientific Latin, which roughly translates to dog ear chewer. Slander! I'm gonna sue someone for sure. Scientific data clearly shows that in 80% of cases it is cats that I infect, while only a mere 20% is shared by dogs, foxes and weasel kind. My lawyer will take it from here. <laughs> Yummy ear. Yup, ear mites just love the ear. It's the external ear canal they enjoy hanging out in the most, but they're often seen visiting quality ear fetish shops. Contrary to other mange-causing mites that burrow into the skin, ear mites only munch on the topmost layer and slurp up body fluids as they leak. The parasite spreads from one host to another by direct physical contact, which can range from fights involving blood, urine and ear gunk splattering about, to warm, loving cuddles, so the disease doesn't really affect lone indoor cats, but occurs frequently in outdoor ones, especially if they live in groups. The average ear mite has a compact body. It looks like a cross between a potato and a sack of potatoes, only smaller. How small? Males are a third or a quarter of a millimeter in size, females slightly larger, so if you strain your eyes more than what's considered healthy, you may even be able to see the tiny beige creatures without a microscope. Being arachnids, ear mites have eight legs, although in females the last pair is underdeveloped. No problem, this just means more room for the ginormous egg to grow and become visible in the belly visible under the microscope, that is. They sport tiny suction cups on the tips of their legs, females on the front four, males on all eight. The males also have a pair of these sticky things on their bellies to get a better grip on the female. Sexy plunger you have there. <coughs> their mate selection, however, is anything but ordinary. I'll tell you why in a minute. The female glues her eggs to the skin with a kind of biological cement. A few days later, larvae emerge, baby mites, so to speak, only six-legged with the rear ones just hanging motionless, but that doesn't hinder them in stuffing their faces with ear. Yummy ear! Days pass again, and after molting, larvae become so-called nymphs, just to molt again in some days' time, turning into somewhat larger nymphs. Their fourth pair of legs is rudimentary, still they're more active than larvae and consume ankle. Of course they don't, it's ear they feed on. Why the hell would it be ankle, come on? Molting a third time is how they become adults, with the entire process taking two to four weeks. And here comes the aforementioned romance peculiarity. Adult males never pair up with adult females, only with larger nymphs, because those are the only ones, apart from adult males, with copulatory belly suckers. I swear on my mother's grave I had no idea she was a minor. Actual mating occurs when the nymph matures into an adult. The females keep laying eggs for a few weeks, after which they perish in heavenly peace. Although their favorite place is clearly the ear canal, some mites occasionally wander off and put up camp somewhere else on the body. Yummy ear! What are you talking about, man? Do you even know where the hell we are? Yummy ear. Should they fall off the host, they typically meet their maker in a week or so. The mites chewing, crawling and their bodily fluids irritate the ear, causing inflammation of the external ear canal with its usual symptoms. The animal scratches and shakes its ears, which you could easily overlook in outdoor cats, but the raw scratch marks and bald spots around the base of the ear canal are generally noticeable. The secretion of ear wax increases and a dark brown, dry, crumbly discharge appears. It's earth, I'm telling you. We've discussed this before, Uncle Billy. Just go home, please, will you? Idiot. 
Chronic inflammation allows bacteria and yeasts to proliferate, which can turn the secretion more fluid and pus-like. Could be vanilla earth custard. Right. <laughs> oh, the, the cellar door. The constant scratching and head shaking can cause blood vessels to burst under the skin, leading to oral or ear hematoma formation, narrowing or even blocking the ear canal. In neglected cases, the skin can thicken with cauliflower-like growths popping up everywhere, and the secondary bacterial or yeast infections end up spreading to the middle or even the inner ear. The ultimate consequence is, however, extremely rare. Ugh. The severity of symptoms varies by the individual and species. Cases in dogs are usually much milder than those in cats, but can also differ between cats, and the number of mites present doesn't necessarily indicate severity. The apparent inconsistency might be caused by the presence or a lack of individual allergic reaction to ear mites. Any self-respecting hypochondriac is probably dying to know whether these little bastards can infest humans or not. The short answer is no. The long answer is no, but there are a few documented cases of it happening anyway. Diagnosing ear mite infestation is no rocket science. The symptoms and the history are already very suggestive, but finding the mites is what makes the diagnosis definitive. This is usually achieved by otoscopic examination, preferably with magnification, but looking at the ear discharge with a microscope is also a reliable method. See, Uncle Billy, I told you it wasn't Earth. Beelzebub! It's nice to know, of course, if any serious complications are present, where exactly and of what kind, for which otoscopy may not be enough, but various other diagnostic tools can aid us. When treating ear mite infestation, we have two goals. Destroying every parasite, regardless of their developmental stage, and reversing the inflammation and its complications. First, in almost every case, the ear canal needs to be cleansed of all that nasty earth. I mean, not earth, not earth, discharge! <laughs> Actually, ear cleaning might be necessary several times throughout the weeks of treatment, and it's a good idea to let the veterinarian do at least the first one. The process isn't a joyride for the animal, and general anesthesia may be required. The cleaned ear canal can now be treated with eardrops containing some sort of mite-killing agent, usually combined with antimicrobial and anti-inflammatory ingredients. There's a slight problem though. Stuff put in the ears doesn't kill mites camping in the southeast scapula region, and after the treatment is over, these out-of-reach parasites can simply recolonize the ear. Yummy ear! Yummy ear! It's recommended, therefore, to pick a treatment with an antiparasitic effect that spreads over the entire body surface, for which several so-called spot-ons or transdermal solutions are suitable. <laughs> Apply them once and their effect generally lasts weeks or months. You may not even need to use eardrops this way, which is, let's just say, beneficial to the mental health of both the patient and the owner. Effective oral agents also exist, but no oral products are actually licensed against ear mites, at least not in 2023, but this may change in the future. Because ear mites spread easily, it's recommended to give antiparasitic treatment to susceptible cohabiting pets as well, even if they don't show symptoms, because asymptomatic infestation is possible, especially in dogs. And how to prevent this abomination? If your pet has no contact with other potentially infested animals, that's a pretty reliable prevention method, but if it's not an option, couldn't you just use those long-acting spot-ons we talked about? Well, those are not licensed for prevention. You can nonetheless give them regularly to animals at risk, such as outdoor cats, because they do eradicate potential fledgling infestations. And I know what you're thinking. Just how many of these freaking anti-flea, tick, worm and whatnot oozes do I have to squirt on that wretched animal? 
Well, there's good news. Several products effective against various other parasites also have anti-ear mite action, so the spot on you always use may already have you covered on this front as well. If you take the instruction leaflet out of the trash, you can find out if that's the case. Or ask your veterinarian. Summing it up, ear mites are common parasites prevalent around the world, mainly infesting outdoor cats, but they can occur in dogs and mustelids as well. They can cause painful, itchy inflammation of the ear canal with characteristic dark, dry, crumbly discharge. Sit down, Uncle Billy! Uncomplicated cases aren't difficult to treat with the appropriate measures and products. Health. It makes you live longer. Yummy ear. I prefer it so bead. The technical information in this video was fact-checked by ear gladiator Marton Bolog and parasitologist-biologist nerd Sándor Szekeres. I thank them very much.